Nicholas Bornois of Capital Link, I would like to welcome you all to uh, the session that uh, Dr. Martin Stopford uh, is going to make a presentation on the very hot topic of decarbonization and shipping to win or not to win. Uh, Martin has been presenting at our forum every year, uh, and we have a great cooperation. He's uh, presenting in our forums all around the world. I'd like to thank him uh, very, very much for uh, uh, being with us today. Uh, Dr. Stopford uh, really does not need any introduction. Uh, he's so well known and respected. So Martin, thank you for being with us and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Um, I think I, I, unlike most people uh, in the session today, I haven't, touched, I've got slides. So uh, I, I'm going to share my screen with you in a moment. Um, but uh, the, 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 the topic that um, I chose was uh, to win and not to win. And if we, if I just let me quickly share my slides with you, I just have to maximize it. There we go. I hope. Oh, there we are. Good luck. Uh, perfect. Excellent. Good. Well, you see, you a little faith, but like like so much of the technology that we're dealing with today, it doesn't always work quite right the first time. Which is so. It's lucky we're not going round the Cape in a storm, you know. <laughs> um, this. So let, let, let me start again. And apologies, I'm going to have to scoot through because I'm going to run out of time now. Um, to win or not to win was. Um, I, the idea came, as I mentioned, from uh, Mr. Lim's speech saying that really failure is not an option. And so I decided I'd take a look. I went back to my model and thought, well, what is the chance of failing in all of this? And um, I think actually the, the, this, um, the, this particular chart um, shows uh, the... Um, the, the, on the vertical axis, we've got a uh, million tons of carbon emissions, and the uh, horizontal axis goes through to 2050, and we've got three scenarios here. The first one is the sort of, we carry on with growth, we continue to trade at 14 knots, and we have three waves of technology. And you'll notice that actually, We've been doing well on this particular scenario for the last since 2008 because the fleet slowed down and actually the emissions have been well well below the level of, of this particular scenario the second scenario um we see lower trade growth not two percent but only 0.9 percent um we see the the fleet trading about 12 knots which is roughly where it is at the moment and we again see three waves of technology uh, being introduced. That's the, the which I'll come to back to in a minute. And if you um, follow this through, we move nicely towards uh, about 250 million tons of carbon in 2050, which is well below the IMO's uh, target of 50%, perhaps in line with the sort of new targets that people are saying are going to be set in, 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 the, uh, in the immediate future. And then the third column is where things don't go very well. We have lower trade growth. Uh, we have the, the fleet trades at only 10 knots, which means we need a lot more ships. But of course, we have far fewer carbon emissions. And on this one, we get below 200 million tonnes. So I don't, I don't think in any of this, well, I'll go through the technical side, but I don't think in any of this, there is definitely a major risk that we can't reach um, the IMO target in 2050. The, the, the question more substantially is whether, in fact, as an industry, um, we can actually win, achieve, we can win, in terms of building a really better industry. And that I think is where the focus needs to go when we look, look at our model going forwards. We mustn't obsess with decarbonization, which is a goal, but one of many goals. I think if we can develop the key elements in the industry strategy in a balanced way, the decarbonization will come along with many other things. The, the parallel I'd use is the, the Japanese shipbuilders in the 1950s and 60s. They 
uh, or Japanese industry in the 50s and 60s. They were very embarrassed about the poor quality of their uh, products, um, the poor reputation they had. They adopted quality assurance in a major way. As a result of that, they produced very good quality products, but also their productivity shot up as well, because the things that produce quality products also produced um, uh, much better productivity. And I think that is one of the things that uh, we're really looking at going forwards, is finding the synergies within the whole of the business model that, as we change it. And I think what we need to, to, to get the winning model is for algorithms. And um, those algorithms are the ones that will deal with um, four key elements of the business. Incidentally, an algorithm is a list of rules um, to solve a problem and the steps have to be in the right order. That's the key thing about an algorithm. It tells you what, how, what, tells you what the rules are, but it tells you what order to do them in. So if it's an algorithm for getting dressed, it tells you um, that uh, you have to put on your pants first and your trousers second, or if you're, and you have to be careful that it, you're not saying this to Americans for whom pants are trousers, because if you get your trousers on first, um, you've got to take them off again to put your pants on. And so the whole of this process has to be done in the right way going forwards. And my first algorithm here is trade management. Um, in 30 years time, trade will be completely different. Uh, I think that's almost certain. Uh, one reason for this is climate change, and a second reason is geopolitics. The second algorithm is fleet technology management. I'm talking here about the steps needed um, to implement new ship, ship technology to replace 100,000 ships efficiently. That's the job, you know, the practical job we've got to do with this algorithm is to replace 100,000 ships with ships that do all sorts of clever things. And then the third algorithm, we move beyond the ships to the performance of the fleet as a transport uh, system. And I think cargo transport starts from a vision of the role of cargo within the world economy. And the, the, the challenge that we have going forwards is to make all these bits fit together. Again, I'll come, if I've got time, I'll come back to these. Um, apologies for my rough takeoff. And number four algorithm is corporate governance, because I think the issue that strikes me is, you know, having worked in very big companies in my time, one of the lessons you learn is you can set goals to be blue in the face. But if the subsidiary companies that in, can't, don't have the capacity to implement them, uh, it's not going to succeed. And there's, you know, this presents very real difficulties. And so I believe that, um, I mean, there was a very nice discussion of safety and crews earlier, but I think one mustn't forget in this discussion of the sharp end, the companies who are the people who not only look after the crew, crew, crews, they look after the ships, they look after the customers, and we have to think very hard about company governance. Okay, well, let me run through these as quick as I can so that... Uh, I, I catch up with a bit of lost time. The first algorithm, trade management. And we're talking about here about steps to respond to changing commodity and regional trade, because this is one very big part of the shipping industry's um, uh, job going forwards. Um, a bit of good news is that the business cycle, which dominates everything, it's been mentioned quite a few times today, actually is behaving quite nicely. Uh, this chart shows you um, world GDP and seaborne trade growth rates uh, for the last 50 or 60 years. We've had seven cycles, big cycles in 70 years. This is the COVID one is the seventh and it's bounced back very nicely. It's busy bouncing back quite nicely. Really looks like all the others. We just have to watch out because sometimes there's a nasty, aftertaste. I mean, we got this in the 1980s after the old crises of the 1970s that things weren't pear-shaped in the 80s. And there is, you know, there's a lot of things that happened in the pandemic which might make 
you know, they could cause problems in the world economy going forward. So that's one possibility. But generally, I think um, when we look at trade going through to 2050, um, we have uh, many different scenarios. And one of the things we don't know is quite how this trade is going to develop. Uh, I've got uh, the scenario zero is a continuation of past growth, which I think is not that likely for reasons I'll come to. Scenario one shows trade growing to 21 billion tonnes by 2050. Scenario two, 16.9, and scenario three, 11.6. Uh, the long term is not such a problem as the short term, because in the short term, if trade grows rapidly, we need to build a lot of ships. And that means we're going to have to build them with the old technology that's available today. And those ships will be around for a while. If in fact trade doesn't grow so much, there's not so much pressure on expanding the fleet and therefore we, we miss out on that particular issue. Uh, the other uh, dimension of trade is the commodity structure. And I think this makes it clear why uh, uh, there's good reason to be a little bit cautious about the growth rates because 40% of trade today is fossil fuels. These fossil fuels, um, Actually, the ones we carry by sea today uh, generate 11.3 billion tons of carbon when they're used. And I think it's a pretty fair bet that they're going to go down. We may well see some growing trade in the gas area and the new uh, hydrogen, you know, solar's going like gangbusters now. And so we might find ourselves carrying carbon, but hydrogen um, or maybe ammonia. Uh, I was very interested in the discussion um, uh, in the last session about um, th th those two options. But generally, perhaps not so fast growth, and that's, that's an issue here. The other reason to be a little bit cautious about what happens is geopolitical. Trade in the Atlantic has not really expanded. This is seaborne trade in import, seaborne imports in million tons. It's been pretty static for 20 years. If we add Asia, all the, all the trade growth has been in Asia. Maybe China's coming to a point where it's going to peak out on its imports. It's very hard to tell. It's still a big country. But that, again, leaves us with this, this a little bit of uncertainty about just where the growth settles down. If we move on to um, the second algorithm, fleet technology, uh, what steps we need to replace 100,000 ships with this new technology. And I'll go back. This is um, an updated version of scenarios that I produced last year or two years ago, um, looking at how the shipbuilders might cope with the need to build the new fleet that will be required by 2050. And um, we are somewhat limited by existing technology. So this assumes wave one is advanced diesel ships because that's what available but associated with that is a growing wave two of gas and hybrid ships batteries coming along very rapidly lots of lng um, biofuel uh, green uh, methanol that sort of thing those will all go into this area and then finally when the fuel cells are perfected we start to have a wave of zero carbon propulsion and uh, the big issue here is that we've got a, an existing fleet of um, diesel ships and we're going to be building some more. Um, if we put that into a fleet context. This is the fleet by propulsion type based on scenario two. Both of these charts are scenario two uh, uh, for trade and the other variables. And in this case, we see that um, we have a fleet of ships built in 20, which was already on the water in 2020, which is going to gradually decline, but those ships are likely to be with us until 2040. And then there's the diesel ships, the diesel based ships built in 2020 and later. And I'm arguing that I'm expecting to see quite a lot of those. So there's going to be a lot of the diesel technology around for the 30 years. Then, of course, we've got the gas hybrid and the carbon, the zero carbon ships coming into 
the, the, the trade. But I, I ran a, a, a scenario on my model to just work out how much of the carbon was being produced by the different types of ships. I mean, clearly the zero carbon ships don't produce any carbon, but of the, the total carbon of 15 billion tonnes between now and 2050, um, that's the average of the three scenarios. Um, half of that is produced by pre-2020 built diesel ships and another 22% by post-2020 diesel ships. So what this is saying is really, we need to focus very, very hard on how we manage the diesel ships. I mean, of course, fuel cells are important, but let's get the perspective right here. The carbon is gonna come from these existing ships. And that is quite a complex dynamic because in the first place, it's expensive. Um, all of this stuff for the new building is upfront investment. And this is a chart that I put, you know, I did this a few months ago, I uh, haven't updated it, but $3.4 trillion of investment I mean, you know, we always run off these big numbers. They often prove to be roughly right, you know, and the money appears from somewhere. Um, but I think enough about the fleet and the ships. Let's move on to the cargo transport performance, which is the third algorithm in this whole model. The, we need to think about adding value to the cargo transport service, the world trade. When we apply this technology, I mean, what McKinsey says is you start from the value added and you work backwards. And if we take um, this particular um, model and look at cargo transportation as a big picture thing, the big problem that we have here, we start with the transport managers, we move through to the exporters, we have the importers, and we have the various uh, commercial and regulatory and financial documentation bodies that are in the middle here. And uh, Maersk famously came up with this example of a container transported from um, uh, Africa to Europe, and it had 40 bits of documentation, and the whole container got held up because one of the documents stuck to another one. But uh, the issue is not just the 40 documents. The issue is the number of computer systems that this information moves through. We've got here um, on this, I've just shown 20, but there are many more, some big, some small, some legacy, some state of the art. There's been efforts to standardize this process of documentation, the single window, but I think that you know, we have to look very hard at other options. Blockchain, microservices is a very big new technology that can help to deal with this. But one way or the other, we have to find a way of passing information through many, many legacy systems so that we can slicken up the delivery of cargo, uh, especially in the container business. And finally, corporate governance. Um, to win, each company needs a vision. And that means you know, that we, we, we need to look at the organization in which people have the information, the skills, and the authority to win. And I think my concern is, of course, I'm very concerned about the seafarers, but my concern is that the companies that we have today, we're not really designed for this purpose. I remember many years ago, Sami Offer saying to me, you know, you needed one you needed about one to one and a half people in the office for every ship at sea. And they ran a very big and very successful business operation based on that. But when you start, that was in a period of relatively stable technology. Today, we're moving into massive change and you do need to move things uh, forward rapidly. And indeed, I need to move forward very rapidly too. So I'm going to skip over these last couple of slides very quickly, which is just really to remind you that shipping is a very difficult business. This is a McKinsey chart. It relates the lot size for each product to the product variance per factory in numbers. And, you know, if you're doing um, smartphones, that's fine. Um, if you're doing shipbuilding, you may only have, you may have eight products and only sell three, uh, you, you, the products in lots of three. If we put shipping onto this chart, 
containers is massively complex because they have so many product types and so many lot sizes. And bulk shipping is quite simple. It's a different business. So I think you have to separate the business out and come up with different ways of doing this. You have a look at my charts later when you do that. Um, the main point is that we are a business with 25,000 companies. Shipping has 25,000 companies. Each has six ships. On the rule of thumb of one or two people in the office per ship at sea, that's 12 or 14 people. Is the company organization able to do that? Uh, many of you will have seen this chart before. This is what we're heading for. Um, conclusions, well, trade management. We need steps to handle changing trade technology and steps. Cargo interests have to have a big role in this. And it was uh, great to hear Kerry making those points about the involvement of big shippers. Shell, Shell used to run the tanker business along with a few other companies years ago. Um, algorithm two, fleet technology management. Steps to manage waves of technical change, steps to get the best performance from the existing fleet, which could account for 50% of emissions. Algorithm three, fleet performance management, protocols to standardize systems and telematics, and, uh, and steps to manage all the transport performance better. And finally, governance steps to develop company governance for those 26,000 companies, a new vision. People have information, skills, and authority to achieve winning performance. Nicholas, I've finished. <laughs> That's it. Martin, thank you very much. You've done it uh, very well despite- uh, I'm exhausted. <laughs> but thank you very much. The slides will be available on the online so tremendous tremendous thanks martin always for a great yeah. presentation apologies for the stuff bye-bye thank you so much thank you bye-bye <laughs>